This is the Yokel Idaho Midweek Report, where we give you guys a quick overview of the news in Idaho for the last week. This week, we have a bill looking to better define the definition of men and women. Satanists lose a lawsuit. ITD drops the ball on and track application, in and out, and so much more. Starting us off here with the Blaine Amendment and fight for religious freedom in education. This comes by the Gem State Chronicle by Brian Ullman. As we discussed a week or two ago, Representative Elena Price has introduced a resolution that would significantly shift the state's approach to funding religious education. The resolution seeks to put the repeal of the Blaine Amendment, a clause in the Idaho Constitution that bars public funding for religious institutions, before Idaho voters. This amendment has been part of the state's constitution since its inception, reflecting a 19th century conflict over funding parochial schools and the broader issue of separation of church and state. The Blaine Amendment's roots trace back to a time when Catholics, facing what they perceived as a Protestant dominance in public education, established their own schools. Congressman James Blaine's efforts to prevent public funding of these schools at the national level failed, but he succeeded in embedding this principle in the constitutions of new states, including Idaho. The state's Supreme Court upheld this stance in 1971, ruling against the use of public school buses to transport students to parochial schools. However, the legal landscape shifted with the 2020 U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Esperanza v. Montana Department of Revenue, which ruled that states cannot discriminate against religious institutions if they allow public money to flow to private ones. This decision has reignited the debate over the Blaine Amendment in Idaho with implications for potential educational choice programs that could include religious schools. The introduction of the House Joint Resolution 1 has sparked controversy with opponents fearing that the repeal of the Blaine Amendment could siphon funds from public schools and lead to tax dollars supporting Christian institutions. Proponents, however, argue that the amendment is an outdated product of an anti-religious sentiment and that its repeal would foster a more inclusive educational environment. The debate over the Blaine Amendment is not just about funding. It is a reflection of the ongoing cultural discussion on the role of religion in public life. As Idaho grapples with this issue, the outcome could reshape the state's education system and set a precedent for how religious freedom and education intersects in the modern era. And speaking of things that are hot in the culture right now, Idaho Bill seeks to legally define men and women. This comes by KTVB7 by Joe Paris. In the Idaho State House, a bill that aims to legally define the terms man and woman has sparked a significant conversation about gender and biology. House Bill 421, sponsored by Representative Julie Young, seeks to clarify these terms in state code based on biological and reproductive attributes, stating that there are only two sexes, male and female. This bill has also specified that gender is synonymous with sex, not gender identity. During public testimony, intersex TikTok influencer Sydney Madison voiced concerns about the bill's implications. Sydney argued that some people are born with a combination of male and female biological traits and that the binary definition proposed in the bill does not account for them. Sydney and other Idahoans expressed that the bill's language would erase their existence in the eyes of the law. They argued that intersex individuals, who make up approximately 2% of the global population, deserve the same respect and rights as other groups. House Bill 421 has brought to light the public's confusion about sex and the culture war that is being had for the definition of man and woman. And continuing into other questionable things, we have Idaho Court Dismisses the Satanic Temple's Lawsuit Over Abortion Rights. This comes from KTVB7 by Tracy Binghurst. Chief U.S. District Judge David C. Nye has dismissed a lawsuit brought by the Satanic Temple, TST, against Idaho Attorney General Raul Labrador, Ada County Prosecutor Jan Bennett's, and the state of Idaho over the state's abortion laws. The suit, which claimed that the state infringed on Temple members' rights by denying them the right to an abortion, was dismissed with prejudice and without leave to amend. In his decision, Judge Nye stated that TST's arguments, while interesting, were convoluted and did not lead to the desired result. Idaho Attorney General Raul Labrador's office hailed the dismissal as a defeat to Satanists, emphasizing that the court rejected every claim made by the Satanic Temple and described one of their positions as producing a blatantly absurd result. 
The lawsuit from TST was based on religious tenets that state people have autonomy over their own body, claiming that members in Idaho were unable to perform their religious rights to an abortion. One of the Satanic Temple's lawyers, W. James McNaughton, stated that they will appeal the decision to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, challenging the state on profound constitutional and social issues. The legal battle between the Satanic Temple and the state of Idaho reflects the ongoing debate over abortion rights. The case is set to continue in the higher courts, with both sides firmly entrenched in their positions. And coming off that from Cold Hearts, we go to Cold Towns, the coldest town in the Gem State. This comes by the Boise Dab by Ann Daly. Stanley, nestled at the base of the stunning Sawtooth Mountain Range, is no stranger to the chill. Known for its record-breaking low temperatures, Stanley has earned its reputation as one of the coldest places in Idaho and the United States. This winter, Stanley recorded the lowest temperature in Idaho at a bone-chilling negative 28 degrees on January 13th, as reported by the National Weather Service. But this is not a new phenomenon for Stanley. In 1983, the town set a record for its lowest temperature, with the mercury plummeting to negative 54 degrees. Stanley's frigid temperatures are not just a state record. According to a study by Steve Dutch of the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay, Stanley led the nation in recording the nation's lowest temperatures 522 times from 1996 to 2015. Even in the height of summer, Stanley is not safe from freezing temperatures. So why is Stanley so cold? The town's location in a small elevated basin at over 6,000 feet allows it to cool down more efficiently on clear, dry nights than surrounding lower elevations. The lack of wind flow and the presence of a winter snowpack further amplifies the overnight cooling. Stanley's climate also sees a wide range of low to high temperatures, with an average difference of over 40 degrees in the summer. So if you're planning on visiting Stanley, be sure to pack for all weather possibilities. If you're enjoying the Midweek Report, do us a favor and hit the like button on YouTube, Rumble, or Twitter. It helps us reach more folks who love Idaho just like you. And speaking of things up in the northern part of Idaho, Idaho's leading Idaho plan funds bridge replacement in Shoshone County. This comes by the Shoshone News by Josh McDonald. In Shoshone County, three significant bridge replacement projects are on the horizon, with details recently made public by the Local Highway Technical Assistant Council, or LHTAC. Honestly, it's more easier to say the words. The projects, which include the Bunker Avenue Bridge in Kellogg, the Two Mile Road Bridge near Osborne, and the historic Silver Bridge near Albert's Landing, are anticipating to cost a total of $11.2 million. Funding for these projects came from the Idaho Senate Bill 1359, also known as Governor Little's Leading Idaho Plan. This state-funded program, designed to address older, load-restricted bridges, allocated $400 million in state surplus dollars for such initiatives. The urgency to address these bridges is evident, particularly in the case of the historic Silver Bridge, which is set to begin construction in 2024. With a load limit reduced to 6,000 pounds, the bridge's deteriorating state necessitates prompt action. The reconstruction of these bridges is expected to enhance the safety of the local transportation network, benefiting residents and businesses in the area. While the Silver Bridge project will require a full closure of the existing roadway during its construction phase, the other two projects in Kellogg and Osborne are slated to begin in March of 2025. These improvements are poised to have a significant and positive impact on the local community, ensuring safer and more reliable transportation infrastructure for years to come. Speaking of infrastructure woes, McCall to decide on funding for critical water system improvements. This comes by the Boise Dab by Autumn Robertsons. The city of McCall is gearing up to present a significant proposal to its voters. A $16.5 million bond aimed at upgrading and expanding the city's water system. With the current water treatment plant and storage chains struggling to meet demand and comply with regulations, the city emphasized the urgency of the project, which is set to happen regardless of the bond's outcome. The bond, if supported, would spread the cost over a longer period, reducing the immediate financial impact on current consumers. Aaron Greaves, McCall's communication manager, clarified that the ballot measure is not about approving the project itself, but about how it will be financed. The alternative to the bond would be a steep 100% increase in water rates over three years. 
The proposed expansion includes adding two more filters to the existing two at the water treatment plant, which has faced issues with water clarity and disinfection violations. The plant's limitations were highlighted during a mechanical failure in 2023, which nearly led to a boiler order due to reduced water production. The project also called for a new 2 million gallon water storage tank to address the current tank's near capacity status. This addition would help the water treatment plant meet peak demands and avoid further violations. If the bond is approved, the plant's expansion is expected to be operational by 2027, with the new tank ready by 2026. Bacall's funding options are limited with the choice between a drastic rate hike or a bond. The city could seek judicial confirmation for the bond, but Public Works Director Nathan Stewart warns this could be costly, time-consuming, and risky. The city prefers the transparency and efficiency of a voter-approved bond. The McCall City Council will decide on February 22nd whether to place the bond on the May 21st ballot, with Stewart's emphasizing the importance of addressing the water system's needs promptly to avoid service disruptions and emergency rate increases. And continuing to talk about water, we have water relief on the horizon for southwest Ada County residents. This comes from the Boise Dev by Margaret Carmel. For homeowners south of Lake Hazel Road near Five Mile Road, the wait for a reliable water source is finally coming to an end. Veolia is set to launch a project in February that will extend water service to 108 homes in the area. This initiative comes as a much-needed solution for residents whose private wells have been drying up since 2021, largely due to the area's rapid development affecting the recharge of shallow wells. The Ada County Commissioners have stepped in to alleviate the burden on these homeowners, some of whom are on fixed incomes and have been caught in a tough spot, facing either the high costs of drilling deeper wells or the challenge of coordinating with neighbors to connect to Veolia's service. In a move to provide relief, the commissioners are using $2.7 million in federal relief funds from the American Rescue Plan Act to fund the project, which will also enhance fire protection in the community. Veolia, unable to cover the cost of new connections due to legal and ethical constraints, has expressed gratitude for the county's intervention. The project, expected to wrap up in August, will save customers an estimated twenty to $30,000 each, while 20 to 30 customers are anticipated to connect immediately due to pressing water access issues, the opportunity will be open to all affected residents. For more details on connecting to the system, residents are encouraged to reach out to Veolia. In transitioning from civic efficiency to civic failure, ITD's grant application air and future Boise Salt Lake City Rail. This comes by the Boise Dab by Don Day. In a frustrating turn of events, to say the least, the Idaho Transportation Department, ITD, missed a crucial step in potentially connecting Boise and Salt Lake City by passenger rail. Tasked with applying for the Federal Rail Administration's Corridor Identification and Development Program, that's a mouthful, ITD instead mistakenly applied for a different grant leaving the much-anticipated project in limbo. This oversight meant the application to explore the revival of the Amtrak Pioneer Line, which would have reestablished a rail link absent since 1997, was never actually considered. The air came to light only at the end of 2023, despite the project garnering significant support from local and state officials, including Governor Brad Little, U.S. Senator Jim Risch, and Mike Crapo. ITD's misstep was initially discovered by the city of Boise, contradicting earlier reports that the Federal Rail Administration had rejected the application. ITD acknowledged the mistake, emphasizing it was an honest error, and expressed a commitment to rectify the situation. Despite the setback, optimism remains among local leaders. Both Boise Mayor Laura McLean and Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall have voiced their continued support for the rail project, highlighting the strong community desire to see the service reinstated. They're exploring alternative funding resources and awaiting future grant opportunities to help keep the dream alive. Looking ahead, ITD plans to reapply for the grant application in anticipation of the Federal Rail Administration's next round of applications, expected in 2025. With a program authorized through 2026, there is a renewed hope for establishing a rail length that would not only connect the communities, but also revive a cherished mode of travel between Idaho and Utah. Has this show been valuable for you? Don't hesitate to share it. Your shares help us spread the word about our beautiful state. 
From quick commutes to fast food, we have in and out construction underway near Boise Mall. This comes from the Boise Dev by Don Day. For those burger enthusiasts out there who wish the line was faster at in and out so they could have some, your wait might be almost over. Construction has officially begun on the highly anticipated in and out burger at Boise Town Square. After a period of seeming inactivity, the site of the former Pier 1 Imports has been transformed into a bustling construction zone, signaling the start of a new chapter for the California based burger chain in Idaho's capital. The construction kickoff wasn't without its hurdles. In and out's construction manager, Todd Smith, reported prolonged negotiations with Boise Town Square Mall and PetSmart ownership teams to secure consent agreements for the proposed construction. These discussions, spanning six months, have finally reached the final stages of approval. For long-time listeners of the show, you may remember that the Boise Town Square in and out location is set to offer indoor seating for 74 patrons and an additional 20 outdoor seats. Not to mention the drive through lane is designed to accommodate a queue of 30 cars, ensuring that Boise's appetite for the iconic burgers and fries will be well catered to. With one in and out already serving up deliciousness in Meridian and plans for two more locations in the works, the Boise Mall site is a testament to the burger chain's growing footprint in the Treasure Valley. We here at Local Yokel will keep an eye out for more updates on the Boise in and out location as it develops, so stay tuned. Speaking of tasty things and franchises expanding, Mountain Mike's Pizza expands in star. This comes by the Boise Dab by Gretchen Parsons. Mountain Mike's Pizza, a pizza chain known for its 20-inch pies, has expanded its footprint in Idaho with a new outlet in star. The restaurant located at 51 North Union Street opened two weeks ago, marking the chain's second location in the Treasure Valley with the first one situated in Meridian along Eagle Road. Mountain Mike's offers an all-you-can-eat pizza lunch buffet, a large salad bar, wings, wine, and beer on tap. The star location also features four large TVs and a kid arcade area, making it a family-friendly dining option. The owners of the star outlet, who also own the Meridian Restaurant, have exclusive rights to develop at least three additional Mountain Mike's locations in the Treasure Valley. Part-time owner Alyssa Trask expressed delight at the warm reception they received when they opened Idaho's first Mountain Mike's Pizza and Meridian. I look forward to sharing the brand's high-quality pizza and friendly environment at the new Star location. Mountain Mike's in Star is open daily from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. The pizza chain, which first opened in Palo Alto, California in 1978, now boasts nearly 300 locations across the western U.S., the new star location is set to continue the brand's tradition of helping friends and family create memories over America's favorite food, pizza. Speaking of things hot and on the western part of the U.S. here, Judge Clear's path for University of Phoenix purchase, open meetings lawsuit rejected. This comes by the Boise Dab by Kevin Richard of ITD News. An Ada County judge has dismissed an open meetings lawsuit against the State Board of Education, paving the way for the University of Idaho's proposed $685 million purchase of the University of Phoenix. Judge Jason Scott ruled that the State Board had reasonable grounds to believe that the University of Idaho was competing with other bidders for Phoenix, thereby justifying its closed-door discussion. This ruling removes a significant hurdle for the University of Idaho's planned acquisition of Phoenix, a complex and controversial deal that the university officials hope to finalize earlier this year. The university anticipates that the purchase will generate millions of dollars in revenue from Phoenix's national operations, while downplaying the potential financial risks, which could reach up to $10 million annually. A lawsuit filed by Attorney General Raul Labrador in June centered on a rare invoked section of the state open meetings law. The state board had discussed the potential of Phoenix purchase in a closed executive session before publicly endorsing the deal on a May 18th vote. The closed meeting was justified based on a clause that covers a competitive purchase involving a state agency and public bidders in other states or nations. 
The court's decision is not the final step in the Phoenix purchase. The University of Idaho's accreditors still needing to approve the deal. Additionally, a nonprofit connected to the University of Idaho must finance the purchase. If a deal is not closed by May 31st, either the University of Idaho or Phoenix could withdraw from the agreement. Despite the remaining challenges, this rule marks a significant step forward in the University of Idaho's ambitious acquisition plan. Don't want to miss out on learning more about Idaho? Make sure to subscribe or follow us so you don't miss any of our future content. And moving on, we have Idaho legislation proposes stricter annexation rules for cities. This comes from the Boise Dev by Margaret Carmel. A new piece of legislation introduced by Senator Julie Van Orden, Republican representative from Pingree, and Representative Julianne Young, Republican representative from Blackfoot, is set to simplify Idaho's annexation code and make it more challenging for cities to annex property into city limits without explicit consent from property owners. Under the proposed legislation, a city wishing to annex an area would require the consent of two-thirds of the property owners and at least 50% of the total area. This marks a significant increase from the simple majority currently required under Idaho's code for two types of annexation. This move aims to give property owners more say in the annexation process, reflecting a shift towards more democratic and consensual urban expansion practices. The bill outlines a detailed process for cities seeking annexation, including sending notices to impacted landowners and holding public hearings. An annexation plan must be provided, detailing the tax impact, the effect on local governments providing services, and the impact on other local governments currently serving the area. This plan aims to ensure transparency and allow property owners to make informed decisions regarding the annexation. The current code, by contrast, is more complex, with three types of annexation based on the number of parcels to be annexed and the level of consent already given. The new bill seeks to streamline this process, making it clearer and more straightforward for all parties involved. As Idaho continues to grow, this legislation represents a pivotal moment in the state's approach to urban development and expansion. By requiring a higher threshold of consent, the bill aims to ensure that property owners have a significant say in the annexation process, potentially reshaping Idaho's urban landscapes in the years to come. And closing us out here towards the end of the episode, Idaho State Employee Health Insurance Changes Hands. This comes by the East Idaho News by Kyle Finansteel of the Idaho Capital Sun. In a significant shift, Idaho State Government Employee Health Insurance is set to be managed by Regency Blue Shield of Idaho this summer. This change affects over 25,000 employees and more than 35,000 of their family members, marking the first time Idaho has changed insurers in nearly two decades. The contract for Regency Blue Shield was signed on January 4th, setting the stage for the Lewiston-based insurer to take over Idaho State Health Insurance Policy in July. However, a final decision on the contract is still pending due to a lawsuit seeking to uncover how outstanding analysis compared costs between insurers vying for the contract. Blue Cross of Idaho, the insurer that held the contract since 2004, initiated the lawsuit over concealed records. Regency Blue Shield, a nonprofit mutual health insurer serving over 396,000 Idahoans, previously held the Idaho State Employee Health Insurance contract before Blue Cross. The company is now working toward a, quote, smooth transition, end quote, to overseeing the contract, promising to offer three health insurance plan tiers and ensuring its network covers nearly every available practitioner and facility in the state of Idaho. However, the transition may not be without its challenges, sadly. Regency must help patients switch over, providing transition for care service for 90 days, identifying and contracting people who have pre-authorization during the switch, and helping members transition prescription pre-authorizations. The contract also stipulates that Regency must provide an optimal mail-in pharmacy and design out-of-pocket cost shares to incentivize mail as the primary order and refill mechanism. As Idaho State employees and their families brace for this change, more information on the contract change will be available for the spring's open enrollment. The final decision on the contract award, contested by Blue Cross, will be made once the ongoing lawsuit is resolved. 
And with that, closing us out here, thank you for listening to the entire report. I sincerely hope you found it enjoyable and valuable. If you like the midweek report, make sure to check out the full show where John and I talk about the main stories going on in Idaho and discuss them. Also, if we missed any important points or provided incorrect information, please feel free to reach out to us via email at localyokelidaho2022 at gmail.com or on Twitter by tweeting us at localyokelidaho. With the small team we have here, we're not able to cover everything, but we do our best to cover the most interesting and important stories. Thank you for your continued support and assistance. That's all for now. I wish you a fantastic rest of your week. Godspeed. Godspeed.